January 12, 2010, as you'll remember, magnitude 7 earthquake hit Haiti. 300,000 people buried. Estimates vary, but between 100,000 and 200,000 people perished. And immediately, search and rescue teams were dispatched from around the world, coming from as far as Iceland. Um, and they started arriving within about 48 hours. And at that point, truly heroic efforts ensued, working day and night <coughs> to get people out. And all of that resulted in saving 134 folks. Of those, 47 were just six US teams. And that leads to a challenge, because it turns out that 90% of the rescues that you can make after a calamity like this happen in the first 48 hours, before international teams are able to get there. And the teams that do have the, the big search equipment, the cameras that can look into these spaces, are few. They're really big, it's bulky, it's expensive. And so they, it's very hard for them to cover a lot of territory. So what we need is something that is low cost, easy to use, and portable, so you can have it forward deployed before the emergency happens all around the world. Closer to home, I'm sure you all saw the news about that hostage situation at a Trader Joe's in Los Angeles. And uh, from this, the first look at this picture, it's pretty evident what's happening. We've got a bunch of uh, police officers putting themselves in harm's way to help civilians inside. But if you look closer, there's a few weird things. First, that's a mirror and a stick. <laughs> And that's how they're getting a view inside the space. Second, that's a window and a pretty thin wall. So if somebody decided to shoot at the officers, they're pretty exposed. And finally, that guy who's planning the operation can't see what's going on in real time. He's relying on what he's hearing from the guy holding the mirror. That's not really safe for officers. It's not really safe for civilians. So we thought there was a better way. And after seeing a lot of these situations, our team decided to build a company, a technology company, around keeping first responders safer. So you might say, well, why a business, right? Why not a nonprofit? Why not a research lab? And there were three reasons. First, we want this to have scale. We want to reach a lot of first responders. And we think that if we can show that there's a profit to be made in serving them, we can find the capital and the leadership and the, and the talent to really scale this and get to a lot of folks. Second, we want to keep these philosophically, we want to keep these systems low cost, and we think the market's a good way to bring that pressure to keep us uh, honest on that. And finally, we want to lead people to get into this market. There's not much innovation here. And so we want to show other companies that you can make a viable business by innovating for first responders. And then why technology? It might seem obvious in a forum like this, but there's a lot of ways we could have helped. We could have looked at the policy, we could have looked at procedures, things that don't need a lab. But fundamentally, we think that the problem for first responders is often situational awareness, and that is where cameras and imaging systems excel. Second, first responder technology is terrible, and it is old, and it doesn't work very well. And then third, this is an awesome time to be building a hardware product. The ability to collaborate internationally, the ability to rapid prototype, makes it easier than it's ever been to make really cool things. So, high-tech first responder startup, let's go, right? couple problems, right? Um, first, what do you think about when you hear high tech? I think of a robot on a spaceship chasing a de-extended tyrannosaur. You probably think of flying cars. But if you talk to a venture capitalist or to another investor, they tend to think of high tech as enterprise software solutions or some really cool consumer app. And they don't really tend to have experience with or an understanding of a company that's going to be going after helping first responders. The second is something more of a, like a tech fatigue problem. And that's that you're probably sitting there and saying, you know, I've read TechCrunch or uh, Wired recently, and I saw some lab with some really cool robot out at Stanford that said, that's going to solve first response forever. And I can't think of an article I've read in the last 12 months where they don't at some point say, oh, and at some point it's going to be used for search and rescue. And I don't, I don't blame labs for doing this because they're out there developing the cutting edge of robotics and automation to change the world. Um, but, uh, but eventually, in any interview, they're going to say, like, well, tell me about the practical applications. And so they'll say, oh, well, we'll use it for search and rescue. Right? Um, in practice, when you take these technologies out, it doesn't always work out quite as you expect. <laughs> And that's because these things have been developed for the technology, not really for the end user. 
So if there's tech out there, why aren't first responders using it? So we did something radical, we asked them, and what they told us was, it's hard to get, it's expensive, it's hard to use, which means it requires a lot of training, and if I'm getting shot at or I'm in a collapsing building, I don't really want to be steering something around. It's hard to carry with uh, these folks, and they're carrying tons of equipment already. And finally, it's really hard to understand what a little robot is seeing in a room a thousand feet away if you're not there. So we realized we had to make something that was low cost so that it could be broadly deployed, something incredibly easy to use, so you had to use almost no mental energy to operate it, something that was small and light, easy to carry with you, and then video that was truly naturally intuitive so that you could feel as if you were standing in that space without having to think too hard about it. And what came out of that was this, throwable omnidirectional camera, something you can throw through a window, lower into a collapsed structure, pop up into an attic, and get an instant 360 degree view of everything that was going on so many people can look in many directions simultaneously and can keep their orientation no matter what happens to a camera as it flies through the air or drops down some stairs. Now we thought that was gonna take us nine to 12 months to develop, it took a little bit longer, uh, but after six years, <laughs> dozens of prototypes, and the patience of very patient uh, first responder teams as we broke these things a thousand times with them. Uh, this is what the product was. The dangers that we face here, we're going into kind of the unknown. You've got somebody in a room, you don't know who it is, you don't know numbers, you don't know if they're armed, you don't know if there are innocents in that room. When you enter that structure, you have to read and react, figure out where the suspect could be hiding, and all that happens within seconds. I've got 42 years in law enforcement. I've learned that the real safety component for a police officer is knowing what they're going to get into before they get there. Police, open up! I mean, how do you do that? Well, this thing gives you that opportunity. told you we wanted to get to scale. We wanted to get this out into the world as fast as we could. We're starting to do that. We're with 125 teams around the world uh, on multiple continents um, across law enforcement, um, uh, peacekeeping, defense, and search and rescue. And it turns out the tech we developed has some other really cool uses. So we took one of our cameras and we threw it off a bridge in California. On the upper right, you'll see what happens to a normal camera if you do that. And on the main screen, you'll see what happens when you have panoramic stabilization. So you can imagine how you can make some pretty cool action cameras, uh, GoPro type things, if you had this uh, technology behind you. The team that developed this uh, across Harvard, MIT, and the Costa Rican Institute for Technology has decades of experience uh, building advanced imaging systems. And uh, I guess what I'll say, in troubled times, everyone who had a hand in building this system is either a first generation immigrant, or a uh, foreign national. We think that uh, technology really can make the world a better place for everybody. It's a, it's a tough time in first response, uh, particularly in law enforcement. There's a lot of distrust between communities and the officers that are meant to serve them. And there's a lot of structural reasons for that and a lot of deep problems that aren't gonna be solved overnight. But we think that when we give people more information, when we allow them to understand the situation, there's an opportunity to de-escalate. There's an opportunity to take your time and make better choices. And there's an opportunity for everyone to be a little bit safer and go home at the end of the night. Thanks for your time.